Welcome to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast, bringing you free resources to relax, recall, and succeed in pharmacology. You can find the link to this free nursing pharmacology book and others at memorizingpharm.com. We're going to start with 3.2 antimicrobial basics, basics concepts related to antimicrobial therapy. Before we learn about medications that are used to treat infections in our patients, we must first understand the basics of microbiology. Let's begin with a review of bacteria. Bacteria are found in nearly every habitat on Earth, including within and on humans. Most bacteria are harmless or considered helpful, but some are pathogens. A pathogen is defined as an organism causing disease to its host. Pathogens, when overgrown, can cause significant health problems or even death for your patients. Bacteria may be identified when a patient has an infection by using a cultural insensitivity test or a gram stain test. Antimicrobials may be classified as a broad spectrum or narrow spectrum based on the variety of bacteria they effectively treat. Additionally, antibiotics may be bacteriostatic or bactericidal in terms of how it targets the bacteria. Finally, the mechanism of action is considered in the selection of an antibiotic. In addition to antibiotics, antimicrobials also include medications used to treat viruses and fungi. Each of these topics will be discussed in more detail below, along with the issue of drug resistance. Culture and sensitivity. When a patient presents signs or symptoms of an infection, healthcare providers will begin the detective work needed to identify the source of the infection. A culture is a test performed to examine different body substances for the presence of bacteria or fungus. These culture samples are commonly collected from a patient's blood, urine, sputum, wound bed, etc. Nurses are commonly responsible for the collection of culture samples and must be continuous to collect the sample prior to the administration of antibiotics. Antibiotic administration prior to a culture can result in a delayed identification of the organism and complicate the patient's recovery. Once culture samples are collected, they are then incubated in a solution that promotes bacterial or fungal growth and spread onto a special culture plate. Clinical microbiologists subsequently monitor the culture for signs of organism growth to aid in the diagnosis of the infectious pathogen. A sensitivity analysis is often performed to select an effective antibiotic to treat the microorganism. If the organism shows resistance to the antibiotics using the test, those antibiotics will not provide effective treatment for the patient's infection. Sometimes a patient may begin antibiotic treatment for an infection, but will be switched to a different, more effective antibiotic based on the culture and sensitivity results. Gram-positive versus gram-negative. A gram stain is another type of test that is used to assist in classification of pathogens. Gram stains are useful for quickly identifying if bacteria are gram-positive or gram-negative, based on the staining patterns of their cellular walls. Utilizing gram stain allows microbiologists to look for characteristic violet or red slash pink staining patterns when they examine the organisms under a microscope. Identification of bacteria as gram positive or gram negative assists the healthcare provider in quickly selecting an appropriate antibiotic to treat the infection. Sample gram positive infections. Streptococcus, the name which comes from the Greek word for twisted chain, is responsible for many types of infectious diseases in humans. Streptococcus is an example of a gram-positive infection, and it is identified by its ability to lyse or break down red blood cells when grown on blood agar. S. pyogenes is a type of B. hemolytic streptococcus. The species is considered a pyogenic pathogen because of the assisted pus production observed with, its, with infections it causes. In figure 3.1, the gram stain specimen streptococcus, it shows A, which is a blue circle, and it has dark blue strains without the circle. And it has in figure B, it's a circle, an orange circle, and it shows orange strains throughout the circle as well. S. pyogens is the most commonly cause of bacterial pharyngitis, and it is also a common cause of various skin infections that can be re- relatively mild or life-threatening. Staphylococcus is a second example of a gram-positive bacteria. The bacteria Staphylococcus comes from a Greek word for bunches of grates, which describes their microscopic appearance and culture. Strains of S. aureus causes a wide variety of infections in humans, including skin infections that produce boils, carbuncles, cellulitis, or Petco. 
Many strains of S. aeritis have developed resistance to antibiotics. Some antibiotic resistant strains are designated as MRSA, methicillin resistant S. aeritis, and vancomycin resistant S. aeritis, VRSA. These strains are some of the most difficult to treat because they exhibit resistance to nearly all available antibiotics, not just methicillin and vancomycin. Because they are difficult to treat with antibiotics, infections can be lethal, and MRSA and VRSA are also contagious, which posing a serious threat in hospitals, nursing homes, dialysis facilities, and other places where there are large populations of elderly, bedridden, or immunocompromised patients. In Figure 3.2, it shows an image of Staphylococcus bacterial microscopically. So it's the background is green, it's a square, and it shows a bunch of little yellow circles in the middle they are, that are shaped like grapes. Sample gram-negative infections. So gram-negative bacteria often grow between aerobic and anaerobic areas, such as the intestines, and some gram-negative bacteria causes severe, sometimes life-threatening diseases. The genus Neisseria, for example, includes the bacteria N. gonorrhea, the causative agent of the sexually transmitted infection gonorrhea, and N. meningitis, the causative act agent of bacterial meningitis. In figure 3.3, it shows an image of Neisseria meningitis, and it's a orange square, and it has grape-like structures in the middle, and they're white. Um, it's on a chocolate agar plate. Another common gram-negative infection that is seen in hospitalized patients is E. coli, and this is a frequent culprit for urinary tract infections due to its presence in the GI tract. So broad-spectrum versus narrow-spectrum antimicrobials. Spectrum of activity is one of the factors that provides users provides use when selecting antibiotics to treat a patient's infection. A narrow-spectrum antimicrobial targets only specific subsets of bacterial pathogens. For example, some narrow-spectrum drugs only target gram-positive bacteria, but others target only gram-negative bacteria. If the pathogen-causing infection has been identified in a cultural and sensitivity test, it is best to use a narrow-spectrum antimicrobial and minimize collateral damage to the normal microbacteria. <coughs> a broad-spectrum antimicrobial targets a wide variety of bacterial pathogens, including both gram-positive and gram-negative species, and it is frequently used to cover a wide range of potential pathogens while waiting on the laboratory identification of the infecting pathogen. Broad-spectrum antimicrobials are also used for polymicrobial infections or as prophylactic prevention of infections with surgery slash invasive procedures. Finally, broad-spectrum antimicrobials may be selected to treat an infection when a narrow-spectrum drug fails because of development of drug resistance by the target pathogen. One risk associated with use, using broad-spectrum antimicrobials is that they will also target a broad spectrum of the normal microbacteria that causes diarrhea. They also increase the use risk of a superinfection, a secondary infection, and a patient having a pre-existing infection. A superinfection develops when the antimicrobial intended for the pre-existing infection kills the protective microbiota, allowing another pathogen resistance to the antimicrobial to proliferate and causing a secondary infection. Common examples of superinfections that develop as a result of antimicrobial use include yeast infections, pseudomembranous colitis caused by C. diff, which can be fatal. Probiotics such as lactobacillus are commonly used for individuals with C. diff to induce normal bacteria into the GI system and improve bowel function. So in th figure 3.4, it shows C. diff, a cram-positive rod-shaped bacterium, and it causes se severe colitis and diarrhea often after the normal gut microbiota is eradicated by antibiotics, and it's a black and white photo. So let's recap. A broad-spectrum antibiotic will treat gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and a narrow-spectrum antibiotic will treat either gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. If a patient is started on an antibiotic that is gram-positive and the culture identifies as a gram-negative organism, the medication will not improve the patient's status. The selection of an incorrect antibiotic can lead to adverse reactions and increased bacterial resistance. At times, a broad-spectrum antibiotic may be administered prior to receiving the culture report due to the severity of the illness of the patient, and once the culture is reported, the antibiotic therapy is tailored to the patient. It is the nurse's responsibility to review culture results and ensure that the results have been communicated to the prescribing provider. Antimicrobial actions, antibacterial actions, bacteriostatic versus bacteriocidal. 
So when a provider selects an antibacterial drug, it is important to consider how and where the drug will ultimately target the bacterial. Antibacterial drugs can be either biostatic or bactericidal in their interactions with offending bacteria. Bacterostatic drugs causes bacteria to stop reproducing. However, they may not like ultimately kill the bacteria. In contrast, bactericidal drugs kill their back target bacteria. The decision about whether to use a bacterostatic or a bactericidal drug often depends on the type of infection and the overall immune status of the patient. In a healthy patient with strong immune defenses, both bacteriostatic and bactericidal drugs can be effective in achieving clinical cold cure. However, when a patient is immunocompromised, a bacterial drug is essential for the successful treatment of infections. Regardless of the immune system status of the patient, life-threatening infections such as acute endocarditis require the use of a bacterial drug to eliminate all offending bacteria. For mechanism of action, another consideration in the selection of an antibacterial drug is the drug's mechanism of action. Each class of antibacterial drugs has a unique mechanism of action, the way in which a drug affects microbiomes at the cellular level. For example, cephalosporins act on the integrity of the cell wall. In contrast, amino glycosides impact ribosome function and inhibit protein synthesis, which stops the proliferation of cells. So in figure 3.5, it shows various mechanisms of actions of antimicrobial medication. Um, it shows the cytoplasm. It almost looks like a blue-shaped capsule, and inside it shows DNA synthesis, RNA synthesis, cell wall, plasma membrane, ribosomes, and metabolic pathways. It shows a summary of how various antibiotics affect the cell wall, the plasma membrane, the ribosomes, metabolic pathways, or DNA synthesis of bacteria. So for antiviral, similar to antibacterial medications, antiviral drugs directly impact interaction and reproduction of the offending microorganism. Antibacterial medications are required for treating bacterial infections. Antivirals treat specific viral infections. For example, Tamiflu is commonly prescribed to treat influenza. Unlike antimicrobials, antiviral medications do not kill the offending virus, but they work to reduce replication and development of the virus. For antifungal, antifungal or antimyotic agents are medications that are used to treat fungal infections. These medications work by killing the cells of the fungus or inhibiting the reproduction of the cells. Unlike antibacterial and antiviral medications, many antifungals are applied topically to the affected area. Fungal infections commonly affect surface areas of the body, including the toes, nails, mouth, groin, etc. For example, candida albicans is a type of fungi that when overgrown in the mouth produces oral thrush. Patients experiencing thrush may be prescribed oral antifungal swish and spit medications such as nystatin. For drug resistance, although there is a wide availability of medications that are useful for treating infection, greater limitations in effectiveness are being seen. According to the Centers for Disease Control in 2019, each year in the U.S., at least 2 million people are infected with an antibiotic-resistant infection and more than 23,000 die. Prevention strategies. In the U.S. and many other countries, most antimicrobial drugs are self-administered by a patient at home. Unfortunately, many patients stop taking antimicrobials once their symptoms dissipate and they feel better. If a 10-day course of treatment is prescribed, many patients only take the drug for 5 to 6 days, unaware of the negative consequences of not completing the full course of treatment. The problem is a shorter course of treatment not only fails to kill the target organisms to the expected levels, but also assists in creating drug-resistant variants within the body. A patient sign adherence amplifies drug resistance when the recommended course of treatment is too long. For example, treatment of tuberculosis has a recommended treatment regimen lasting from anywhere from six months to a year, and the CDC estimates that about one-third of the world's population is infected with TB, most living in underdeveloped or underserved regions where antimicrobial drugs are available over-the-counter. In such countries, there may be even lower rates of adherence than in developed areas, and non-adherence leads to antibiotic resistance and more difficulty in controlling pathogens. As a direct result, the emergence of multi-drug resistant strains of TB is becoming a huge problem. The overprescription of antimicrobials also contributes to antibiotic resistance, and patients often demand antibiotics for diseases that do not require them, like viral colds and ear infections, and pharmaceutical companies aggressively market drugs to physicians and clinics, making it easy for them to give free samples to patients, and some pharmacies even offer certain antibiotics free to low-income patients with a prescription. 
In recent years, various initiatives have aimed to educate patients and clinicians about the duteous use of antibiotics. However, previous studies have shown that parental expectations for antimicrobial prescriptions for children actually increased. One possible solution that is being explored is a regimen called directly observed therapy, which involves the supervised am administration of medications to patients. Patients are either required to visit a healthcare facility to receive their medications, or healthcare professionals must administer medication in patients' home or another designated location. DOT has been implemented in many cases for the treatment of TB and has been shown to be effective. Indeed, DOT is an integral part of WHO's global strategy for eradicating TB. But this is particular strategy for all antibiotics. Would patients taking penicillin, for example, be more or less likely to adhere to the full course of treatment if they had to travel to a healthcare facility to receive each dose? Who would pay for the increased costs associated with DOT? When it comes to overprescription, should providers or drug companies be policied when it comes to overprescribing antibiotics to enforce best practices? What group should assume this responsibility and what penalties would be effective in discouraging overprescription? This is a complex issue with no clear, easy solution. However, what is clear is that all patients need extensive education regarding the duteous and complete use of medication to increase adherence and decrease the opportunity for antimicrobial resistance. So for critical thinking, activity 3.2a, reflecting on current healthcare challenges regarding the ongoing emergence of antimicrobial resistant organisms, what actions could you take within the nursing practice to help prevent drug resistance? Thanks for listening to the Memorizing Pharmacology podcast. You can sign up for the email list at memorizingpharm.com to get your pharmacology suffixes cheat sheet, find drug pronunciations, and other free resources to relax, recall, and succeed in pharmacology class. Thanks again for listening. Music was by Policy. <laughs>